Uh, what do we mean when we say the state? What do, what do people think of when they think of the state or government? Well, is that for itself? The state. The state. Country. The country is a state. The country is a state, but the country can also just be the people. What is the difference between a state and the people living in a country? Yeah. The uh, authorized use of force. Yeah. So we have uh, legitimization of violence. What else? I guess uh, what I think of it is pretty much we live in. Pretty much we have. So basically, anarchism doesn't mean like no government, doesn't mean no order, and basically the government we have now is where we have things forced onto us whether we disagree with them or agree with them. Yeah, so getting at um, the discrepancy between state mechanisms and what people want, so the difference between governments and for democracy example, with a little d. For example, I mean, in anarchism there could be government, but it would be like horizontal democracy like we, we've been doing here. Yeah. Can you speak up so everybody can hear? Government interference in personal life? Yeah, so very much the sense that the government is separate from your own personal life and can intrude on your privacy. All right, so I think what all these definitions have been getting at is the, this common anarchist critique that the government uh, inhibits or limits freedom in a certain way. Uh, but uh, as Patrick has been emphasizing, uh, Anarchists don't see the alternative to government as an emphasis on market forces, but rather on uh, what I, what I as, as I like to describe it as democracy without government. So sort of the direct democracy that we've all been practicing here in Occupy Boston, Occupy Wall Street, and all other places. So this is just a great example of the ways that we can work together but in an egalitarian manner that nonetheless uh, allows everybody to participate inclusively. Um, because, as Patrick pointed out, one of the things that we don't like about capitalism is that it creates these inequalities. Well, under state socialism, these inequalities exist as well. Unless you're uh, the premier or the first, uh, what was uh, Gaddafi's full title, is like first comrade in the revolution or something like that. <laughs> Unless you're the first comrade in the glorious revolution of Libya, you're like there isn't real equality there. You're more equal than everybody else. So anarchism recognizes that uh, you can't just say, well, to get equality, we're going to just uh, put everything into the state's hands. No, you need to have uh, real grassroots de democracy throughout the entirety of society. And uh, so that essentially... Um, that doesn't mean that things are unorganized. That means things are organized from the bottom up. And, yeah, that's why some people say when they look at uh, the famous anarchist thinker Bookchkin, and when he's talking about his uh, federated model, they're saying, well, he, he's not an anarchist. He's talking about these governmental associations. They're just very little power, and that's exactly the point. They still have the power to do things, and they're organized, but they're all coming from the bottom up. Um, and so... Now to get over to the main uh, main difference between anarchists and state socialists. So if you're a Marxist, if you're a communist, uh, you basically have the same sort of end vision as anarchists, which is this self-organized, uh, self-producing society where people are free to um, enact the arts, there's no hunger, people can work together on various projects. But what difference, what, what difference what differentiates us anarchists from the Marxists and the communists is that we say, well, you can't just uh, establish this dictator of the proletariat and then expect that to wither away. The state doesn't wither away by itself. Um, um, the state is intimately tied up with policing, as we mentioned before, and the other main legitimate use of violence, namely war militarism. And you can't just expect the state to give up that, uh, that right uh, voluntarily. Um, all right. I think I think I've touched on all the main things I want to talk about there. So now Patrick, so now Patrick's going to talk about what anarchists are for. We've talked quite a bit about what we're against, but anarchism is not a nihilistic project. There are several uh, values guiding the many many different forms of anarchism. I I could stand here for like. 10 minutes just naming all the different branches of anarchism that I can think of, but I'm not going to do that. So we're going to talk about what unites us, and then after that, uh, talk about, uh, then he's going to talk a bit about how 
anarchists have put those values into practice, so how we've organized uh, the types of movements we've been involved in, things like that. And then, like I said, we're going to have a open discussion uh, probably somewhere else, so that way it's easier for people to participate. Great. So, um, I touched on, it, I think, in a roundabout way, some of these values um, during my first speech. Um, so, in terms of the values that motivate anarchists, um, the, the key one is, is freedom. I mean, anarchism, it comes from the Greek, it means no rulers. It doesn't actually mean no state. So that means anybody who is in a position of power should be challenged, uh, no matter what uh, cloak he or she is in, um, whether it's formal or informal uh, control. Um, a key value is participation in the organizations and social structures that affect you, that you live in, that you teach in, that you work in. Um, so that's everything from you know the home, the household, to the neighborhood, to the school, to the workplace, to the community at large, and then for matters that are you know of, of regional and uh, you know national uh, focus, those too. Um, we're all about uh, direct action. So whereas some people see the ills of of any given system, like ours, um, and they will you know, their their plan of action will be okay. The people in power are doing something we don't like. So we need to petition them to convince them to stop doing that. So we need to convince Congress to enact single payer health care, or we need to convince, you know, our state government to, you know, get rid of eminent domain or something like that. Um, anarchists believe in direct action. We believe in, you know, acting as if we're already free. So if there's, you know, say, you know, in your neighborhood, um, the, the classic example, it isn't terribly relevant now, but I think you'll, you'll get the idea, um, is if your community needs a new well, um, the, you know, the, the traditional activist or uh, reformist role would be, okay, we'll, we'll go to the town hall or the state capitol, wherever you need to, we'll file the papers we need to get a well filed, we'll go through all the permissions, probably have to pay a lot of taxes, and then we'll finally, after maybe six months a year, actually get a well. Well, dir direct action suggests that anarchists you know, it, with those principles, should start digging the well right now. We, should, we, we shouldn't wait for permission to do the things that we need to survive, the things we need to live a, a decent life. Um, another key anarchist uh, uh, principle is uh, what's called intersectionality. So in the 1960s, we had a flourishing of, you know, it's sort of a general societal awakening about the myriad of things that are wrong with society right now. So we have, we, you know, oppression of women. Uh, thank you, thanks to the, you know, the second and then third wave feminist movements, that became mainstream. That you know, there are these structures, often you know, very hidden, that uh, promote you know, men over women, uh, and especially you know, male identified people over female identified people. Um, we also have um, you know, the civil rights movement coming out of the '60s too. That there are these official laws and then unofficial norms that preserve white supremacy and give white people privilege. Um, and then, of course, going back to you know the 30s with the labor struggles, talking about how, as a class, the poor people not only are officially discriminated against, but also have all sorts of unofficial discrimination. The kind of words and the kind of slang the poor people use, that was a calling card for elites to discriminate against them, no matter if they were the same, the same race, the same religion, the same, um, the same sort of background. Um, so, instead of organizing these as single issue as single issue problems, where okay, we need to fix one, and as soon as that's fixed, we can go to the next one, and as soon as that's fixed, we go to the next one. Um, you know, key anarchist insight, and certainly we aren't the only ones who realize this. Um, they're all interwoven; they all support each other. So that means, uh, as we organize, as we think about the future world we want to create, and how we change the world right now, we have to deal with all of them, both internally in ourselves and also the social movements that we create. Uh, we can't have, um, we can't abolish, you know, class society. We can't get rid of uh, capitalism if, you know, we let all these other oppressions that ail us creep into our movements. Um, and that's a, that's a key problem and a, a, a you know, a, a key diagnosis for a lot of the failures of social movements in the 60s and 70s was a failure to understand that all these different oppressions um, work against all of you know all of us, no matter what we're trying to fix. Um, and then the last one I want to talk about is uh, it's called prefigurative politics. Um, Gandhi 
probably is, is the most famous uh, um, and probably most eloquent exponent of that. He said, be the change you want to see in the world. However, from an anarchist point of view, that isn't simply, well, I don't like cruelty to animals, so I won't eat meat. That's a really individualistic way of doing things. You aren't going to change the system. Um, prefigurative politics means we need to embody right here and right now the values of the world we want to see in the future. So if we want to see a small d democratic world, a world of liberated people who are empowered to actually you know, do the things they want to do, to live creative and fulfilled lives, we can't get there unless the movements that we are in embody those, unless they are directly democratic, unless they're non-hierarchical, as long as they, they actually you know, um, you know, uh, value and emphasize and hold up every single person, no matter what you know, their, their race, their gender, their sexuality, um, or, or class is. It has to be, uh, it has to be all together, unless, um, you know, in, in some situations, for example, um, state socialists, going back to what Tristan was saying, um, they have a very hierarchical top-down structure for getting to an egalitarian society. And I think history is littered with examples of showing how this just won't work. The people at the top never stop wanting to be at the top. It's part of, I mean, it's part of the human condition. The only way to mitigate against that is to create a world where there is no top. Or, you know, there's, the top is so close to the ground, there's no real advantage given. Um, so, with those values in mind, um, anarchists think we need two different kinds of uh, institutions, two different kinds of things in our movement to get to a better world. Um, we call them alternative institutions and counter institutions. So alternative ones are ones where they'll take care of the, the tasks, the things they need to get done in society that capitalism and the state are doing very poorly right now. Um, and counter institutions are ones that are actively fighting against the system as it is right now. You need both. You simply can't you know, go off and start a co-op or a commune somewhere. Capitalism won't mind. And sooner or later, you know, the, the government will stop by to you to pay your back taxes anyway. Um, you, you can't simply fight, um, you know, you, they can't fight large corporations, you can't fight centralized government without having, um, you know, an institution that will back you up, an institution outside the state um, that'll take care of it. Um, for example, uh, I was just reading about how in Britain, um, in the 30s and 40s, they didn't really have a, a decent welfare system. So, like, if you were out of work, they had all these, you know, voluntarily um, created, community-based, uh, what they called friendly associations. So there's sort of a there's mutual aid, you know, we all help each other out. Um, you know, if one person in the group just lost their job, we'll help out, we'll help cook for them, we'll take care of them. Um, that was really effective when, say, all the steel workers had to go out on strike and weren't, get, weren't collecting a paycheck. Without those institutions, they would have had to go back to work or starve or find work elsewhere. They would have been broken. Um, however, then, in, you know, the, after World War II, as Britain sets up this welfare state, all of a sudden, the means to support somebody while they're on strike has been moved to the hands of the government. It's been, all the other friendly societies have been abolished or otherwise regulated to death. So, big surprise, in 1980, Margaret Thatcher comes in and all of a sudden you can't collect unemployment or any sort of welfare or low-income benefits if you're out on strike. So all of a sudden, what used to be this wonderful way of, the, of you know, working people supporting themselves got shifted over to the government and then was used as a tool against them. And big surprise, you know, unionism has been on the decline there, um, where it used to be the one of the most strongest in the first world. And we need that kind of fighting in order to actually win a new society. Um, you know, on smaller examples, we have, uh, like I said, unions are a great counter institution. Uh, many are better than others. Uh, I think, you know, especially because of the cozy relationships between a lot of unions and the government. Um, think of all the acronyms you think of when you think of unions. Those are probably the ones I'm talking about, um, including some unions that have signs here. Um, we need uh, unions that, like I said, embody the anarchist values of democracy. That, you know, we don't have labor bureaucrats. Like, I used to live in D.C. Every day on my way to work, I'd pass this gorgeous, huge AFL-CIO building, you know, gold-lined everything, 
the suits these guys were wearing as they walked, and you would not believe. Um, that's not how we uh, win victories for working people. Um, that, that tells me that when you have you know, a building, an eye shot of the White House, your priorities aren't exactly right. Um, you know, there are many unions, including the International Workers of the World, uh, the CNT in Spain, um, even, even some non-revolutionary unions like the United Electrical Workers um, and the Carpenters are much more democratic. And surprise, surprise, they actually tend to win a lot more. Um, on small scales, um, like I was saying, you know, alternative institutions, Food Not Bombs, um, is an organization entirely decentralized in cities across the country, large and small. And the idea is, you know, the, the poor and homeless are falling through the cracks of society. Instead of lobbying the state capital, instead of lobbying the mayors, instead of lobbying Congress, we go and we feed them directly. So we cook food, we get donations from, um, from businesses, we, we make the food ourselves, and we go. Like, sometimes it's once a week, sometimes and when the campaigns are big, it's almost every day. And we actually set up and we feed the homeless in Boston Common, um, in, you know, L.A., New York, all over the place. Even the, the little town um, I grew up in, Bethlehem, had its own food on bombs. Um, however, you know, this, this does not go unnoticed. So I, I believe it's... Um, it's Miami, which had, which had a great Food Not Bombs presence. They were actually feeding a lot of people, doing a lot of good. These are, you know, usually almost all of them were explicitly anarchists were involved. Got a lot of homeless people involved, helping themselves out. Um, the, the state passed a regulation, or it may have been the Miami City Council, um, that it was illegal to distribute food to the homeless. So all of a sudden, there's this law passed that prevents anarchists from doing this sort of direct action. That not only says that obviously we have a long way to go, that when we get stronger, we will be able to ignore those laws and dare them to enforce them. But it also means that actions like that, structures like that, are actually working. They're afraid of them. That's a good sign. Um, the modern school movement um, started in the early, early years of this past century, the 20th century. And the idea was, okay, schools as, as we know them, as I think almost all of us went through, are probably the, you know, some of the least democratic organizations we've ever been in. I think I, I, can, I can't count the number of times my teacher said, listen, you're going to have to do this. I don't care. This is not a democracy. Well, anarchists see that as a bit of a problem. So uh, the modern school movement started, you know, 1910s, uh, started in, actually in Spain, where we had... Um, this guy, uh, Francisco Ferrer, go across the countryside. He was lucky enough, he had you know, a rich friend in France who died, gave him a ton of money. So what did he do? He set up all these schools all across the country. Now, Spain at that time was ruled um, rather heavy-handed between the monarchy and the church. Um, so what he did, set up secular schools that were democratic, that taught science, that taught English, or Spanish in that case, instead of Latin was incredibly dangerous, um, but it, it spread like wildfire. It was, really, it, was, it was a really inspiring act. It inspired people across Europe and, and, uh, and the world. Of course, somewhere to Food Not Bombs uh, getting outlawed in Miami, um, the state, in a much more bloody fashion, um, framed him for murder and executed him um, as the only way to really get rid of him. Um, now, in the U.S., that trend picked up. Um, anarchists in New York City, in Los Angeles, Chicago, all across the country started these schools with the idea that, um, you know, of prefigurative politics, of the idea that we need to participate in the, the structures that, that we're in. Um, the only way we can get to an anarchist society is if we create more anarchists. If we create, even people if they don't associate with that term, they believe in democracy, they're used to and, you know, have matured in democratic structures. So they know how to do that. They know how to deliberate. And, more importantly, once they get out of those structures, once they get out of those schools, they're in a position to realize how undemocratic the rest of the world is, the rest of society is, and demand that it become more democratic. Um, real quick, I, I'm going over. Uh, worker cooperatives, another great example. Um, those are probably the most visible examples of an alternative society here today. There are thousands in the U.S. Uh, there are quite a few here in Boston, too. Um, and it's, there are a lot of campaigns um, and a lot of organizations that will help you either start up your own worker cooperative or can help you buy out an existing business that